Please join me in our first prayer. Lord of creation, whose glory is around and within us, open our eyes to your wonders that we may serve you with reverence and know your peace at our life's end through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning, church. We welcome you to First United Methodist Church of Florence. We are here to worship our God as the family of God, and we pray God's blessings on our time together as we worship and study. So help us today to set our minds on the wonderful grace of God. Let's all stand and we'll sing together, See the Morning Sun Ascending. of faith the historic Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified dead and buried the third day he rose from the dead he ascended unto heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome to First United Methodist Church here in Florence. I'm Dale Cohen, senior pastor, and I want to add my word of greeting to that which Terry Stubblefield, our associate, has already shared with you in the greeting this morning. We're so glad that you're here on this beautiful day. I want to encourage everybody to fill out the connection card, the little tear-off section in the worship guide, 
and in just a few moments when the offering is collected, you can put your completed card in there. I also want to welcome those of you who are worshiping with us online. Thank you for being here. We feel your presence here among us, and we hope that you feel our presence there through the singing and the fellowship and the spirit uh, that moves through this place. Uh, we believe that it can be there with you as well. I want to encourage you to go uh, there on Facebook in the comment section and let us know that you're here, or uh, you can go to our website, fumcflow.org and click on the registration link there. And we would love to know that you were with us today and hope you'll come back. Want everybody here to um, uh, remember that in a couple of weeks, we will be having the Ministry Architects consultation. And if you're willing to be a part of one of the listening groups, uh, you can check that on your connection card. Um, also, on a congregational care note, Marie Plyler passed away on Thursday, and her celebration of life will be this Tuesday at 2 p.m. at Greenview Funeral Home. Visitation is tomorrow evening from 6 to 8 p.m., and please keep Herbert and the family in your prayers. Wednesday evening activities continue this week. We're starting a new study for the adults. It's on the book of Acts. Uh, Bill Huddleston is going to kick us off this week because uh, both Terry and I will be out. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to Bill sharing with you all. Uh, we also have activities for children and youth. Dinner begins at 5. You can reserve a spot for dinner on your connection card or call the church office by noon tomorrow. Uh, we serve between 5 and 6 p.m. And then programming starts at 6 and again, we have for all ages, children, youth, and adults. Some of you may have been noticing our wall over here. And if you haven't noticed it now, every time you walk in, you're going to notice it because I've drawn attention to it. Uh, but we have some moisture issues in the basement that either this week or next week, they're going to be here to begin to do some foundation work trying to get rid of that moisture. Um, we will be repairing the wall, but they said even after they make their repairs in the basement that we probably need to wait a couple of months to be sure that all the moisture has abated before we start doing any woodworking in here. And so I uh, just want you to be aware that, um, yes, we see it, and yes, it's being addressed, but if you've tried to get any work done around your house lately, um, even if it's your spouse that's doing it, sometimes it takes a little more effort than it used to, right? Maybe I should keep my mouth shut. Anyway, uh, we're addressing that. Uh, I'm grateful for your generous support of this congregation for the many ways that you not only give here within the walls of this church, but the way you serve in this community. Uh, we are not just here for the church. We're here for the community, and you demonstrate that in so many ways. And uh, as we prepare to receive our offering, allow me to offer this prayer of consecration. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we don't always understand your ways, but our lack of understanding is an invitation to learn to trust you in all circumstances. Give us faith to believe that when we follow you, and do as you command. We invest in the best life possible. Receive our gifts and our faith as we make our offering today. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
please follow me in your thoughts as I pray for this church and then we'll all pray the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray. God, our Father, we thank you that you are a gracious and generous God, always ready to forgive, to accept us, and that you even seek us to offer us your blessings. Be with every one of us with our needs. Bless all who need you in any way. And may we all pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, so let's stand for the reading of the Gospel. Matthew 20, 1 through 16. Hear now the word of the Lord. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into the vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I'll pay you whatever's right. So they went. When he went out again about noon, and then about three o'clock, he did the same thing. About five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. He said, why are you standing around idle all day? And they said, because nobody's hired us. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the manager, call all the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first that we hired. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received a denarius. When the first ones came, they also thought they would receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last workers only worked one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and in the scorching heat. But he replied to them, Friend, I'm doing to you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I chose to give the last the same as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. Let us pray. Out of your Word and into our hearts, may your truth take root and grow until we're overwhelmed by your love and by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. We're continuing our series on Church 101, where we're studying the Gospel of Matthew and the core values of our church, which today we're on the fourth of our five, which is that we value being Wesleyan. And what this means, therefore, is as a community aligned with the teachings and practices of John Wesley, we believe the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the centrality of grace, the continued growth in personal and social holiness, and the primacy of Scripture, along with tradition, reason, and experience for practical and theological discernment. John Wesley was the founder of the 18th century movement in England known as Methodism. Methodism sparked a religious revival in, the, in England as well as in the United States. A lifelong member of the Church of England and a priest until the day he died, Wesley transformed the religious landscape in both countries with an impact that has lasted almost three quarters of the way into the 20th century. As much a worldview as a theology, Wesleyan thought is rooted in the Bible and its strident message that God is a loving God who embraces all who desire to experience his love and receive his extravagant grace. 
Jesus' parable about the workers in the vineyard is a prime example of how we, through our Wesleyan theology and worldview, experience the wideness of the love and the grace of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's see what this parable has to say to us today. It's a story that Jesus used to describe the attributes of the kingdom of God. Jesus says an employer needed workers for his vineyard, so he went to the market square looking for people to hire. This is the way Matthew records it. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. Because we don't deal in denarii, we need coaching to understand that the landowner is neither overly generous nor miserly in his negotiations with these workers. His offer equals an average day wages for such work in Jesus' day. We also need coaching, though, to understand that in the first century, a typical work day lasted for 12 hours, from sunup until the first stars could be seen in the sky. It was 12 hours, obviously a long and exhausting day, especially in the Middle Eastern heat. Jesus continues, When the landowner went back to the market square about nine in the morning, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He did the same when he went out again about noon and about three o'clock. After hiring the first batch of workers, in that very early morning, the landowner returns to the market square three times and offers to hire anybody who is still looking for work. But the landowner isn't finished even after three o'clock. The scripture says about five o'clock, the landowner went back to the market square and found others standing around, and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. Now these workers who'd been waiting all day for someone to hire them were probably ready to give up hope. And even if they were able to find someone to hire them, I'm sure they had no expectation that they were going to make enough to feed their family for the day because a denarius is what it took. However, Jesus says, when evening came, the vineyard owner said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each received a denarius, a full day's wages. According to the landowner's instructions, his manager gathered the men and he began to pay them, those who came at five and three, and noon, and nine were all paid first, but those who got there early had to wait. So no wonder that there were expectations that were building because each of the late workers received a full day's compensation. However, this generous pay created expectations that were not going to be met for those who came early. Jesus says, now when the first workers hired came and they thought they would receive more, and why wouldn't they? But each also received only a denarius. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. Well, it was an insult, really, for those who had been working all day to have to wait to be paid last. But when the manager then paid all of the late workers the same, those early workers complained that the landowner had made all the others 
equal to them. They weren't complaining about the money as much as they were complaining about the status that was afforded them by the pay that they received. They were forced to be equal with the folks who were late to the game. The story continues. But the landowner replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to the last hired the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? The landowner is unapologetic regarding his desire to pay everyone the same, which was a living wage. Regardless of the hours that they worked, he knew that they needed to provide for their family. Jesus summarizes his parable by saying, So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Now this declaration doesn't sound like good news to competitive people like us, or should I say, like me, because we like to win. We like to be first. We want to be valued. We've worked hard to get where we are. We think we deserve the best and the most in the kingdom of God. Besides, we argue, it breeds laziness and sloth to let others slide by doing less and getting the exact same as what we've earned. Here's the catch. This parable isn't about us. It's a parable about God and who God is. In Jesus We see how God takes the least, the last, and the lost, and he gives them not what they deserve, but he gives to them what he desires for them to receive. The ones who thought they deserved more, they still received all they needed to provide for their family for the day. This parable teaches that we're all equal in God's eyes. Our place in the kingdom of God is a gift and not something that we've earned. If God chooses to give the same gift to others, that is God's choice to make. This parable touches intimately on what it means to be Wesleyan. The most distinctive thing about us as Wesleyans is our emphasis on God's grace as the only way, the only hope that any of us can receive the gift of salvation. We can't earn it, we don't deserve it, and it's not for sale. It's a gift from our loving God. And we base this core belief on the passage in Ephesians that says this, by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not the result of works, so that no one may boast. Our salvation is not an achievement of our own doing. It's a gift, and it's God's gift alone. We affirm as Wesleyans that our sin has left us utterly hopeless and helpless to save ourselves. Further, we also believe God's grace is available to anyone and everyone who desires to receive it. We support that belief with the famous passage in John's Gospel that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Just as the parable of the workers in the vineyard implies, God's gift of grace is available to everyone equally. And if we're willing to receive it, then God is delighted to give it to us. Not all Christians believe that God's salvation is available to everyone. Those who identify theologically with John Calvin, the 16th century Protestant reformer, think that God decided who would and who would not be saved at the beginning of creation. 
This doctrine is described as the limited atonement or more popularly as predestination. Calvin argued further that those whom God saves cannot resist his grace. In other words, they're saved whether they want to be saved or not. And those who are not among the elect, those that God has chosen at creation to be saved, if you're not among the elect, you have no chance of salvation. As Wesleyan Christians, we firmly reject this theological teaching. We firmly reject it because we see God in a completely different way. We believe the only condition for our salvation is our desire to receive God's grace. If we desire it, that is the only condition to receive that gift from God. We also believe that we can resist God's grace and that if we fail to attend to our relationship with God, we can fall away from that grace. Now, the minute we turn back toward God, God receives us with open arms, but we believe that we can risk our salvation by not attending to our faith in a way that keeps it alive and fresh. Yet God will never force us to receive his love and grace. We must choose to accept it, and we must choose to remain in it each and every day. Donald Haynes describes how in their work, Why I Am Not a Calvinist, the authors Jerry Walls and Joseph Dongle illustrate how we as Wesleyan Christians view salvation. They picture a woman held by terrorists for a long time in a dark cell. She experiences the Stockholm Syndrome, where she begins identifying with her captors, and instead of wanting to escape, she thinks she's one of them, and so there's no desire to break free. She willingly remains imprisoned because she sees herself as one of the people that are holding her captive. Only a rescuer from outside can get her out of captivity. She will not work for her own release. The Calvinist view, when we think about how sin has captured us, the Calvinist view of the rescuer, of the divine invasion, is simple. God invades the prison, swoops in and takes the woman up, strips off her blindfold and her shackles, and whisks her off to freedom. She can't resist the rescuer, and he frees her against her will. God is the lone actor, and the woman has no choice. The Wesleyan view is very, very different from that. God works his way into the prison. He has to fight his way in, but once he's in there, then he goes to her cell and gets in by her bedside, and he begins to whisper, do you know who you are? Let me tell you. And he shows her a picture of who she was before she was captured and the life that she lived. He continues to whisper, your captors lied to you, and they told you that you're someone that you aren't. They tried telling you that you belong to them, but you don't. You belong to me. You are not theirs. You are mine. And I've come to take you home. The truth begins to sink in. And the woman begins to remember what life was like before her capture. This glimpse begins to stir something in her where she begins to question her circumstance. The Savior holds up a mirror and she sees her sunken eyes and her matted hair and her frail body in the light of his love. He says, do you see what they've done to you? They seek to destroy you. They don't know how to love you. 
I know how to love you because I created you. The rescuer continues, I know you're afraid. I know you may think that I've come to harm you. But look at my hands. See the blood? I crawled through the barbed wire to get to you. I want to carry you out of here right now, but you must trust me and trust that I am good. Put your arms around me and surrender to me as I take you to freedom. Here the woman could say no, but instead she begins to sense the truth in the rescuer's words. She recognizes what she's been told before was a lie. But this truth is sweet like honey. She responds to his gentle, loving, prodding, putting her arms around his neck and welcoming the freedom that he offers. Sin has captured us. And it's told us lies about who we are. And we live in those lies for so long that they actually become comfortable and seem to be true. But there's always that little bit of doubt. God seeks us out, whispers deep into our souls, and awakens us to the reality of our circumstances. It's like the prodigal son in Luke's gospel where we read, but when the prodigal came to his senses, he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. And the father in the story of the prodigal treated his son like the landowner treated the hired hands in the parable of the workers in the vineyard. He didn't give him what he deserved. He gave him what he wanted him to receive. New life. New strength. New opportunity. I can proudly say as a Wesleyan Christian, that if anyone here desires to receive the gift of God's grace, it is available to you. There are no barriers. There are no conditions except a desire for God to give you His grace. And if you ask, the Scripture tells us that God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful. If you desire to receive His grace, it's yours. Let us pray. Oh God, I know that we live in a world that is set on conditions, that is set on meeting certain standards and towing certain lines that people tell us that if we don't measure up, then we're no good, we're worthless. But you come to us and you tell us, we are your beloved. You value a relationship with us, but you give us the freedom to choose you for ourselves. If we've ever been told that we may not be eligible for your love. Help us to get rid of that idea and to turn toward you fully to receive the gift of your grace. This we pray in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 348. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. And just in case there is somebody here who thinks they're not good enough or that God hasn't already chosen you for salvation, if you need to know
beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves you and that God accepts you and that God receives you into his arms. And as we sing this hymn, I want to invite you to come forward to the altar. And Terry and I will meet you there and we will pray with you and help you experience this wonderful, undeserved, indescribable gift of God's grace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. completely different experience to move in love towards someone not because you fear their punishment but because you want to respond to their love and that's what sets us apart as Methodists is that God 
loves each and every one of us. And nothing delights God more than when we take a step toward Him. In our lives, we'll take many steps, some forward, some backwards. We'll get close to God, we'll pull away from God. That's just natural in every relationship. But always know that our God loves you. And that is the primary attribute of a Wesleyan Christian that we celebrate, is the gift of God's love for each and every one of us. Receive it. Experience it. And live it. May we always be thankful that our God is a gracious God, always ready to accept us and place us in His family.